The Dutch government is enforcing new restrictions on exports of semiconductors to China. Beijing says the United States is behind the move. So how will this impact China's high-tech ambitions? And could it prevent the country from developing its own chip industry? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Semiconductor chips are a vital component in everything from smartphones to cars and even military hardware. China has been looking to ensure its supplies, but it's now facing a major problem. The Netherlands is curbing exports of essential technology used to manufacture the most advanced chips. China says it's part of a campaign by the US to undermine its economy. We'll go to our panel in just a few moments, but first, a report from Fintan Monaghan. China's tech ambitions have hit a roadblock. It's been building up its semiconductor sector, making computer chips that are vital to its economy and military plans. But new rules in the Netherlands could deprive it of essential technology it needs to make the most advanced chips. The Dutch trade minister said the restrictions were imposed on national security grounds, without mentioning any country. But China believes the US is behind the move. China has always opposed the U.S. generalization of the concept of national security, abuse of export controls and using various excuses to cajole or coerce other countries to engage in a science and technology blockade against China. The U.S. imposed sweeping restrictions on semiconductor exports to China during the past year. President Joe Biden says the moves aren't aimed at China's economy, but at advanced military technology that threatens the interests of the U.S. and its allies. At the same time, Washington is investing billions of dollars in building up its own domestic chip plants. The growing high-tech rivalry between the U.S. and China is shaking up global supply chains, and pressure appears to be growing on key players to take sides. Vincent Monaghan, Al Jazeera. So let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. From Brussels, we're joined by Stephen Erlanger, who is the chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe for The New York Times. From Townsend, Wisconsin, is Emily Benson, director of the Project on Trade and Technology at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. And in Brisbane, we're joined by Warwick Powell, adjunct professor at uh, Queensland University of Technology. A warm welcome to you all. Warwick, let's start with you. The Dutch government says that it introduced this legislation uh, due to national security concerns. Are those concerns legitimate, and did it come to those conclusions independently? Look, I think you've got to place all of this into a broader frame, and the broader frame is basically a pronouncement made by President Biden in early March 2021 when he made it very clear that from his point of view, China was not going to become the wealthiest or the leading nation in the world on his watch. And as part of that, there has been a full court press progressively being designed and mounted to curtail China's ability to pose a risk on that particular calculus. As a result of that, the US came to a view that high technology was a critical piece of the jigsaw puzzle and to control China's rise and its ability to challenge the, the, uh, the position of the US as a leader in the world, it had to start to mobilise its allies to implement the full court press. And this is exactly what's happening right now. And it's unsurprising that its European allies are progressively um, uh, beginning to toe the line. Emily, would you would you agree with that, that, that this has much to do with, with what US President Joe Biden said about China not surpassing the US to become a global leader on, on his watch, that this decision by the Dutch government uh, is ultimately being decided somehow behind the scenes by the US? Thank you very much for that question, and I think it's a great one. Uh, I think the, the only difference I would point out is that 
a lot of the efforts to control not only EUV, but the less advanced DUV machines from the Netherlands to China actually began in the previous administration. And that's important context because it really does show an evolution of U.S. policy to regard China increasingly as a threat and less as a customer. That is largely an effect of the pursuit of civil military fusion in China, which increasingly blurs the line between what is primarily a civilian good and one that is primarily a military good. I understand that the United States provided sufficient intelligence to the Dutch government to convince them that it really was a matter of national security to control DUV machines. And furthermore, uh, countries like Japan, the Netherlands, and even South Korea uh, have really had it with IP theft when it comes to high tech. And so I think it was the perfect confluence of factors leading to these additional controls. OK, we'll, we'll get into what these machines actually are and what they do in just a moment. But but first, Stephen, what do you make all of this? Uh, th there must be some legitimate security concerns. I mean, you can't have a potential adversary in possession of technology that may ultimately be used against you, can you? Well, it's a bad idea, certainly. I mean, I'm also struck by this notion that somehow 27 European countries have no agency at all, which is absurd. Um, the Biden administration is struggling to get the EU to go along with it on China. It's not always going very well for reasons that we've all discussed. Um, Europeans' interests are not the same as American interests. But it is also true that, in general, European governments see the threat of Chinese uh, technological espionage and its dual-use production um, as dangerous, as dangerous to them. And so, yes, the U.S. may be pushing, but they're pushing on an increasingly open door. Warwick, will other countries now follow the Dutch lead or feel pressured to do so? Look, I fully expect that the European um, transatlantic allies of the United States to ultimately fall into line. Um, it is true that each nation will come to these decisions in part on their own, but they don't do that outside of context. And the fact of the matter is, is that there is a consistent pattern of behaviour from European um, governments, and that is initially a bit of pushback on various things, a little bit of weighing around on various factors, but ultimately they fall into line. And I think that from the US's point of view, there is a strong expectation that push comes to shove, the transatlantic allies will ultimately do what they're asked to do. And we're going to start to see that happening. I don't uh, think that that is going to be a surprise to anybody. Um, it does put, of course, European countries, you know, into a, into a, into a bit of a pickle, because frankly, We've got, on the one hand, a force that is pushing them to do something that creates tensions with a country that it is that European nations are also heavily dependent upon for a whole bunch of other economic transactions and benefits as well. I guess these are the contradictions of our times, if you will, and Europe in this particular case happens to be, um, you know, right in the middle of it all. Emily, where does this leave EU trade policy? Well, it's interesting. If you look at the EU economic security strategy document that came out, I believe, last Tuesday, it actually outlines that in September they will significantly update their dual-use list of goods. And this will precede, of course, a potential outbound investment screening mechanism in December. So whether or not uh, the Netherlands reached this uh, uh, final outcome completely independently, it is indeed forcing the Europeans to update their dual-use list. Another factor here, of course, is that most countries export controls are tied to a multilateral regime, which is the Vassner Arrangement. Russia is a member of that consensus-based organization, and its membership has precluded the update of any high-tech goods the last couple of cycles. And so either way, 
uh, countries and unions like Europe are having to really contend with how they go about updating regulations. And although this uh, could have come about differently from a diplomatic standpoint, uh, I think we will see greater policy convergence over time. Uh, Stephen, uh, do most EU countries see the merit in, in legislation like this? They understand the reasoning behind it, or is there a feeling to a certain extent that they're being pushed around here by, by the US? I think it's a bit of both, frankly. I mean, yes, the US is pushing, no question. It's also true this Dutch company is particularly sophisticated and its products are particularly desirous. As Jake Sullivan keeps talking, the um, US National Security Advisor keeps talking about de-risking from China. One can define what that means. I think for some Europeans, when he says we want a small garden with high walls, they think the garden will be the size of Texas. But um, they do understand that helping Xi Jinping do more quickly what Xi Jinping says he's going to do, which is to make China capable of invading Taiwan by 2027 and becoming the world's superpower by 2050, may not be in Europe's best interest. Now, it's also true Europe has great trade with China. There's lots of things to do with China. There's climate. The interests of Europe are not exactly the same as the United States. I mean, Europe doesn't see China as a peer rival the way the US does, and Europe doesn't have the same exact Pacific, Indo-Pacific interests, though Europe does have some Indo-Pacific interests. So I think the view of China is getting darker. It's partly Xi Jinping's fault, because he's been much too explicit in, in some people's minds about China's ambitions. Um, the intent is not to curtail China from growing. The intent is to prevent the Chinese military from getting a technological advantage through trade. But, Stephen, I mean, that, that's impossible, isn't it, in, in, in the long term? I mean, China is, is going to somehow circumvent uh, this ban if, if it can't produce the technology itself. Ultimately, uh, if it can't purchase, rather, the technology elsewhere, ultimately it's going gonna, it's gonna to learn to produce the technology itself. Uh, it can, it will, perhaps, but it's proven very difficult. I mean, if you look at the chip uh, work in Taiwan, if you look at this Dutch company, these are not easily replicable uh, things, though China's trying, and China will try, and China at some point will succeed. China's, you know, look, I mean, it's took a long time for them to build a jet airplane that works well, a big a big passenger jet. Their fighters look pretty much like stolen copies of American fighters. So China's busy, China's smart, people are smart, um, they'll get there. But the whole point is the United States doesn't want to make it easier on them to get there. Warwick, without getting too technical here, what sort of equipment are we actually talking about here? We're not talking about semiconductors themselves. We're talking about machines that help to produce semiconductors. Is that right? Well, that's right. And, um, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that in terms of most military applications, um, uh, the chips that are used um, are readily available and manufacturable anyway. So that whole issue is largely a furphy in terms of uh, military applications today. I go back to what I originally said, and that is that the US posture that is shaping this entire um, public policy approach and reorientation around um, technology and trade policy is driven by a broad sweeping ambition to ensure that China does not become the leading nation in the world under Joe Biden's watch. Joe Biden made that very, very clear. Um, it's got nothing to do with Taiwan 2027 either. I think that that is gilding the lily and that is also putting words in the mouths of, um, of people who haven't actually said that. And in fact, General Milley, I think today or yesterday, um, made the observation that he himself couldn't read um, you know, President Xi Jinping's mind in terms of any particular dates for anything at all. So. I don't buy that as the core proposition here. What is on the record, though, 
is that America does have a view that China is catching up to it and is a challenger to it in a very systematic sense. The Europeans also see China as a systematic um, you know, challenge, and that is becoming more and more pronounced in terms of some of the, uh, the language used by different European leaders in this particular space as well. So I think we are going to see policy convergence in a transatlantic sense. The, you know, the, the, the differences in interests, I think, are genuinely there. But nonetheless, I think that the Europeans will ultimately fall into line, um, to some extent at their cost, but they will fall, fall into line and, um, and behave like, um, like the good you know, transatlantic allies that the US expects them to be. But Warwick, Warwick I mean, to what extent are, are, are they on a, a hiding to nothing, Biden and his, his European allies? I mean, Joe Biden himself could be out of a job within 18 months, and, it, and it's only a matter of time, surely, before China achieves its ambitions. It's an unstoppable tide, isn't it? Look, predicting the future is a very difficult thing. And uh, like uh, uh, my, my, my colleague here on the show today, I think uh, there is an expectation uh, that in all probability that uh, Chinese endeavours in this arena will um, ultimately bear fruit. The real question is, is how long will that take and what, what the impact of that delay is likely to be on all range of calculations. Um, you know, China has proven its ability to both emulate technologies um, as well as innovate significantly itself. Um, but, you know, when it was denied an opportunity to participate in the space stations program, it ultimately embarked on its own in initiatives um, to some success. So I think that it is a, a reasonable working assumption that at some point in the not too distant future, you know, whether it's three years, five years or seven or eight or nine years, um, that these technologies will ultimately be um, within the capacity of the Chinese scientific and engineering world. Emily, China's embassy in the Netherlands called the new law an abuse of export control measures that seriously disrupt free trade and international trade rules. I mean, they're right, aren't they? Well, I think what's interesting about the current trilateral arrangement or series of unilateral uh, controls, if you want to think of it a little differently, is that they are not uh, a complete embargo. These are designed to exercise existing choke points over very high-tech parts of the semiconductor supply chain. There are many countries who participate throughout the, the supply chain, Malaysia, South Korea, only a couple of countries really have these viable choke points over the most advanced chips. Those are the United States, the Netherlands, and Japan. What's interesting about the Dutch controls is that they are similar to the Japanese list of 23 items and that they are country agnostic. And so these two governments have gone out of their way to say this isn't about China. This is about taking extra preventive measures to make sure that our most advanced technology is not getting into the wrong hands. And so while I can see that China would be frustrated with the expansion of controls, the Netherlands has had to walk a very fine line between the United States and China. And this is a dynamic that is unlikely to change under a change of administration. We will consent to continue to see close trading partners having to make tough decisions. And again, I think the Netherlands here has done what it can and also taken extra steps to make sure that the European Commission uh, is able to lift these regulations and make them uh, applicable to the 27 member states. Stephen, would, would, would you uh, agree with this? What does this mean for, for global trade rules? Uh, are they going to have to be rewritten now uh, because the US takes a dim view of certain products getting into Chinese hands? Well, the WTO has been in trouble for quite a long time. Um, partly it's Washington's problem and partly it's Washington's problems with with China, but I think the WTO is an institution that uh, is barely alive and people are not paying as much attention to it as perhaps they should, which is a big problem for the European Union, which lives by, you know, quite, quite nicely, rightly, international rules and 
and norms. But if you look at uh, a, a lot of the Biden administration's national industrial policy, which is somewhat new, it doesn't pay much attention to WTO rules. Of course, it always argues that China's manipulating those those rules, et cetera, et cetera. There's always blame being thrown around. But to your point, I do think the WTO is an institution of declining importance. Um, I'm not saying that's bad or good. It's just the fact. I'll, I'll come back to, to Warwick in just a moment. First, Emma, Emily, this seems like your, your ballpark. Would you agree with that? I think there are a couple of different factors at play. I would agree that there are provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, that directly contravene the core objectives of the WTO. They're quite clearly illegal. However, to defend the United States in this particular instance with export controls, the WTO has never sufficiently dealt with issues of national security and investment security. Anything defense related has really been housed elsewhere. And the United States did play a vital role in standing up this 42 member coalition in the Vasnar arrangement. And that is the multilateral setting to promulgate controls. Like I said earlier, because of Russia's membership in that institution, updating it has been essentially impossible and it is now defunct. That begs a lot of questions about lackluster performance of the WTO and ongoing desire to multilateralize where possible, this increased infusion of national security into economic policy making. We probably do need to look at the institutions we have and revitalize them. And that's why I'm particularly optimistic about the potential expansion of the G7. I think from that baseline, uh, we can build something that's a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit better suited to today's environment. Stephen, I, I see you nodding there. Yeah, no, I think what Emily's saying makes enormous sense to me. I mean, the world is shifting. Uh, you're getting more rivalry. You're getting regional rivalries. The, this notion that we're all going to have free trade and it's somehow separated from serious national security issues, let alone what Biden calls a foreign policy for the middle class, makes it a much more competitive world and, frankly, a more protectionist world. I mean, the European Union likes to talk about resilience. Other people would call that protectionism back and forth. I mean, one word is roughly the same as, as the other one. The big question is, how big a garden are you going to wall off? And I think that's the big question. When Ursula von der Leyen talks about de-risking, she's talking about not being overly reliant on any one country, that sometimes that means China, for uh, key materials. But, you know, if you take that too far, you end up with a, a very real kind of uh, export protectionism, export controls, import controls. And that's where that's that's where we're headed, I'm afraid. Um, so I think what Emily's saying makes tremendous sense to me. Okay. Well, Warwick, feel free to, to come in on that point if, if you want. But, but this Dutch legislation didn't mention any particular co uh, company in particular. But of course, the Netherlands is, is home to AMSL, one of the, the most important semiconductor companies in the world. I, I mean, what does this mean for their bottom line? How big a customer for them is China? Well, it won't be helpful to them because um, they would have been banking on um, having sales, you know, into the in, into the forward projections in terms of their P and Ls, and no doubt their CFO is now scratching around to try and figure out um, how they're going to square the circle and make sure that there's sufficient R and D resources and those sorts of things um, to 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 take the take the company forward. But 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 I'll touch on this this broader question of trade whilst um, whilst we're at it, and that is that. I think that there is a shift, obviously, in the configuration of um, you know, the, the, the contours of global trade, the question of um, national security um, has uh, become more prominent. Um, we don't know what that means in terms of um, how the WTO ultimately would treat that, and, and I think that there is ultimately going to be a need to get uh, greater clarity around what those issues actually mean. Um, 
I think it is a challenge ultimately for Europe, though, because the US has for quite some time been reshaping a much more protectionist um, approach to um, where it stands in the world. And its main reverberating effect is actually on the industrial policy landscape um, of the European Union. Um, the aggressive policies that the Biden administration in particular has implemented in terms of luring technology companies and other companies to um, to North America are having an impact on um, on Europe. It is starting to play on the minds of corporates within Europe in terms of whether or not they remain domiciled in a high cost environment or take advantage of subsidies in North America. Okay. These are going to be okay. challenges that will that will create fractures um, between European economic interests and the broader sort of security okay. interests of the transatlantic alliance. Emily, Emily, would you would you agree with that? I mean, it, it, Warwick said that that it, AMSL is sort of you know it's unhelpful for, for their bottom line. Could other industries and technologies now find themselves subject to to similar legislation elsewhere? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, these controls will hit not only ASML, but also ASMI. And so you're looking at the two major Dutch players in the sector. Uh, another great question is one that Peter Wenning, the CEO of AML, has brought up several times, which is to suggest this really won't affect their bottom line too much because they already have uh, a significant amount of back orders and alternative marketplaces. However, that in turn begs the question, if you can't sell to China, to whom can you sell who is willing to pay and able to pay for these machines that can run up to $300 million per machine? So okay. it'll be very contingent upon okay. the United States to help its allies figure I'm out where is a safe, trusted yeah. trading partner. Emily, I'm sorry sorry to, to cut you off. We're, we're almost out of time. Stephen, a very, very quick thought from you just, just to end. Well, simply to say the tensions between Europe and the United States on trade are increasing, they will increase, but Europeans who uh, worry about this also understand that if they're worried about Donald Trump becoming president again, they need to not undermine Joe Biden when he tries to create jobs for white middle-class American voters. Many thanks indeed to, to you all, Stephen Erlanger, Emily Benson and uh, Warwick Powell for uh, being with us uh, today. Much appreciated. And as always, thank you for watching. You can see the programme again at any time by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha, thanks for being with us. We'll see you again. Bye for now.